Over the last few weeks, I've had access to an Xbox Series X as part of a preview program for the system. Now, like I said with my initial impressions, this is a preview. It is not the final version of the system. There are things that are subject to change. There's probably going to be differences in the UI. Some games might perform differently, but this gives us an early look at how the system runs and operates and allows us to check out some of the benefits it has to offer. And honestly, I really like what I'm seeing here. Now, one of the things that we've been able to cover a little bit more extensively is, of course, the system's ability to play backwards compatible games. And I've done a couple of videos kind of highlighting some specifics of that. The main takeaways that I really want to go over as far as my final impressions with that go is that it plays a lot of them really, really well. Uh, as of right now, the vast majority of games that we've played in backwards compatibility mode have not been optimized for use with the system. They simply are benefiting from the improved hardware inside of it. So you're seeing considerably faster load times. Games that use uncapped frame rates are running at a higher, more stable frame rate. Games that use dynamic resolution scaling are staying at a higher resolution. And as we see titles that are getting actual dedicated patches for Series X support, we'll likely see way better optimizations, such as even faster load times or hitting higher frame rates. Playing Xbox One games on the system is pretty much seamless. It feels as if you were just playing it on an Xbox One. Your same save files are brought over. The games launch perfectly fine. There is nothing weird or different about the experience. Playing Xbox 360 and original Xbox games feels pretty much the same as when it was on the older systems, albeit again with all those GNU improvements from the system's better hardware. One of the most intriguing new features though when it comes to backwards compatibility is the concept of Auto HDR. Auto HDR is a new feature exclusive to the series line of systems. This is not something that is available on the Xbox One or any other system for that matter. And what it does is on a platform level, it is looking at games that did not have HDR modes before and is basically adding HDR to them using AI learning. Now, this is sort of a case by case basis kind of thing. There are some games where this is disabled by default because from their own internal testing, it just didn't look great for whatever reason. An example of this is Fallout New Vegas. However, for other titles, as long as you have the setting on, it will be enabled by default. And if you ever see a game where you're like, uh, this kind of looks weird to me, I don't know if I like how Auto HDR looks, you can go in your settings and turn it off temporarily, so that way you can just have the regular experience, which is an awesome choice. It's giving you this kind of cool upgrade that previous games didn't have before, but if it doesn't work out or you just don't like it for whatever reason, it's not something that's forced on you. This is probably my favorite aspect of backwards compatibility on the system, because don't get me wrong, faster load times, higher frame rates, all that kind of stuff is great, but Auto HDR is this kind of unique feature that I don't think anyone really anticipated seeing coming early on, and it breathes some new life into some games that didn't have HDR support before, either because they were older games that, you know, were colorful for their time, but HDR didn't exist yet, or they're games that just didn't get the proper patch to add HDR, for instance, Sunset Overdrive, which is definitely a title that benefits from that expanded color depth. Now, like I said, the vast majority of games that we played in backwards compatibility on the Series X right now have been unoptimized, but the one exception to that is Gears 5, where we do currently have access to a Series X enhanced version. The main benefits of which are allowing the game to play at a smooth 4K60 throughout the entire game. The original version on One X could run at 4K60, but there was definitely some frame dips here and there during some hectic parts of gameplay, and cutscenes were still played in 30 frames. But now, it's 60 all the way through, and it is completely buttery smooth. I feel like I've said buttery smooth like 50 million times, I'm gonna not even use it this time. There's also a major difference in the graphic quality of the game. The Series X version is basically the equivalent of running the PC version at all ultra settings. So when it comes to things like lighting, detailing, what's happening in the distance. Get back, we're coming down. It all around just looks like a much prettier game. And topping all that off, of course, is the fact that the game just loads way, way faster than the One X version would, much like pretty much everything else we've tested. Now, one of the more recent things we were able to do with the Series X was we got access to a handful of cross-generational titles to try out, which gave us two things. One, the ability to try out games that are actually meant for next gen, even though they are games that are coming out on the Xbox One as well. And they also allowed us to test out the smart delivery system where we could play those games on the Xbox One and compare them to the Xbox Series X. Now, of these titles, Dirt 5 is one of the ones that I thought was the most interesting to do, not because it's necessarily this title that's, you know, breaking barriers with the graphics and is an example of what next gen gameplay can look like, but because it's one of the handful of games we can play right now that has the option to play at 120 frames. Now, I do not have game capture that supports 120 FPS, and even if I did, YouTube doesn't support 100 FPS videos, but what I can do is we actually used our camera to record at 120 frames what was happening on screen, playing the game at 120 FPS mode and playing the game at 60 FPS mode, and play it back at half speed. So you can see that for every single frame that was in the 60 FPS mode, we got two frames 
out of the 120 FPS mode that just ends up looking so much more buttery smooth. In fact, when we're playing at half speed like this, it just looks like 60 FPS gameplay. Now, over the course of this preview program, something that started making waves on the internet and isn't entirely accurate was claims of the system running very hot. Now, part of this claim was things being taken out of context from what different people were saying, but the general worry people had was, oh, does this mean the system's gonna be running extremely hot? And the answer is, no, not really at all. I mean, yes, there is heat coming out of the vent because that's why the vent is there, to make sure the heat goes out of the system and doesn't stay inside of it. Will you feel the immediate area around it warm up a little bit? Yeah, probably. That's how most high power electronics end up working out because they're getting rid of all that heat they're producing. The important part is it's not staying inside the system, which is gonna cause any kind of damage or problems. Now, we actually did take the time to point an infrared thermometer towards the inside of the system while we were running it. Where we were really seeing the most heat being pushed is while we were playing the Gears of War 5 Optimized 4 Series X. And and even when we're running that game over a long period of time, the highest we were really seeing was just under 140 degrees Fahrenheit, which translates to just below 60 degrees Celsius, a perfectly safe temperature for a system like this to be running at. One of the really big takeaways I had from my extended period of time with the system is the fact that no matter what I've been playing, whether it's been some of those next-gen, cross-gen titles, playing some of the more involved backwards compatible titles, at no point did I ever audibly hear the system. I mean, if I put my ear directly over the vent, yes, I can hear the fans slowly turning, but as far as just having it in the room around me while I'm playing, I never once heard that fan kick up. Even the Xbox One X, as quiet as it would, if you were really pushing the system System, the fan would eventually kick on. But for the Series X, I mean, as long as I wasn't doing something like, say, blocking the air vent, it has never been audibly loud. And in fact, it's been running this whole time that we've been talking and yeah, I mean, obviously the microphone's above my face and not the, you get the idea though, there's not any kind of room noise coming off of this thing. Now to be fair, as time goes on, there are going to be bigger and better games coming out over time that might push the system a little more heavily. But as things stand right now and everything that we've tested, this thing has been dead quiet. One feature that we've also talked about a little bit in the past, but I wanted to re-highlight again real quick is Quick Resume. This is the feature that allows you to leave one game to go play another one, and then you can still resume from where you left off. Uh, there is a limit to how many games you can have running in this mode, but as far as the kind of just logical experience most people would have, I have not hit it. In general, I've been able to go between multiple games, as many as 10 titles, given some of which included 360 and original Xbox games, but have been able to go back to the first one and still resume no problem. And it's worth noting, something we didn't clarify last time, is that this works even after you've turned the system off. Even if you unplug the system from power, those games will remain in a suspended state so that the next time you plug it in and start it up, you can still resume from where you left off before. And in case a game does end up closing while it's in a suspended state, Obviously, games are still designed with things like autosaves and the regular use. It's never gonna be a situation where you're suddenly caught off guard, the game didn't quick resume where you wanted, and your day is ruined. Now, something that I've admitted to a couple times whenever it comes to new hardware coming out is that I'm very resistant to things when I first see them, and I really need to actually have it in my home or office or wherever and try it out for a while before it actually grows on me. And that's exactly what happened with the Series X. When I first saw images of it, I didn't hate the system, but it was definitely something where I was like, oh, that is a very simple, straightforward, boxy design. I'm not necessarily sure I'm in love with it. And now that I've had it here in the office, I actually really, really like it. There's something about having this thing in tower mode that just kind of has this dark monolithic sense to it. And it's the right amount of unassuming to where it just looks good on my shelf. Now, that being said, I will say, I don't like how it looks sideways. Don't like that for sure. It's very awkward looking, especially because the Xbox logo obviously favors being in tower mode. It's just this awkwardly tall looking system. Obviously, if you have to set up the system that way to make it work in your TV setup, as long as you're able to play games, that's what matters. But visually, this system is definitely meant to be in tower mode. Now, as far as the controller is concerned, I think it comes as no surprise to anyone that most of this basically comes down to if it's not broke, don't fix it. This is very, very similar to the Xbox One controller with a few minor adjustments here and there, but ultimately it ends up feeling like very much the same design. On a minute level, there is some light changes to things like having some texturing on the triggers. The weight distribution of the controller feels a little bit different where it's a little more favoring the handles. But really the biggest changes are the change of D-pad, the addition of a share button, and changing the controller over to having a USB-C port instead of micro USB. 
I really like the change on D-pad here. I've been a big fan of the faceted D-pad on the Elite controllers, and this kind of walks a line of still having a kind of edged webbed approach, but favors having the four main directions pronounced a lot more. So it ends up feeling a lot like a traditional D-pad, but it also is a lot easier to do rolling inputs, which I really appreciate. Now the share button on the other hand is just a new quality of life feature that makes sharing stuff from gameplay a lot easier. On the original Xbox One, they didn't have this present because the original shortcut was meant to be just using the Kinect and we all know how that went. So for the Series X and Series S, we now have this share button that is honestly very straightforward. Simply tapping it will take a screenshot of what's happening currently on screen. And if you hold it, it'll do the most recent 30 seconds of gameplay and record that and upload it to Xbox Live as well. Now, alongside being able to use the physical Series X itself, something else that we've gained access to during this preview program is a beta version of the new Xbox app, which has a couple of major enhancements over the currently existing version. And there's two things I really want to focus on, remote play and social features. Now, the remote play aspect is definitely, I think, one of the most exciting aspects of this. The concept here is pretty basic, right? You can remotely play your Xbox Series X on the go with your phone. What I found to be really interesting, though, is how this works in combination with Quick Resume. Because if there are certain games that you just want to play on the go in mobile, and it's not necessarily something you're going to play at home on TV, well, you can play those games on the go with remote play, come home, play a different game, and later open up remote play again and quick resume what you were playing before on that game in mobile. It just makes the entire experience really seamless jumping between the different platforms. And while we still don't have xCloud support for iOS confirmed just yet, it is really refreshing to see that we are gonna at least get this remote play access for iOS specifically. And obviously Android gets the benefit of both. As for the social features, the Xbox app previously gave you access to your screenshots and gameplay captures that were uploaded to Xbox Live and you could save them to your camera roll. But now with the improved version of the app, you can actually look at this library of clips that you have and directly share them from within the app, cutting down the sharing time immensely and just making it a very simple, straightforward, user-friendly experience. Now, alongside with the system and controller, another accessory we got access to is the expandable storage memory card. Now, there's a couple things about this I really want to cover, one of which is, of course, the idea that using the expandable memory card should be the same experience as using the system's internal SSD, which, based on our testing, looks to be the case. Whether a game is installed on the internal SSD or on the expandable memory card, loading times are the same, the time it takes to set things up and launch games is the same, it is a seamless experience. Another use case I wanted to test out though and try is how long it takes to move files between the internal storage and the expandable memory card. This is a little more situational and specific, but some good examples of why you would want to use this is say, you're going to a friend's house and you want to bring over a game that you already have installed rather than having to deal with, you know, downloading it over at their place. You might have multiple systems and you already took the time to download a game on one of them. And rather than download it on a secondary system, you could just move the memory card over and bring that data along. And it's actually really, really fast. Uh, as a good example, one of the games we moved over was Red Dead Redemption 2, which takes up 120 games gigs as far as the system is concerned, and moving everything from internal SSD to the external storage took about three minutes, which is a lot better than dealing with download times. One last thing I want to talk about with the memory card is heat, because along with the rumors of how hot the Series X can get, there was also talk about the memory card getting way too hot, which not really. Uh, look, if you're running stuff off the memory card, obviously it's going to get hot because it is constantly moving data back and forth between the system and the memory card. And to kind of test how bad it can be, we played games off of the expandable storage for a long period of time, turned off the Xbox, unplugged the memory card, and yeah, the metal part of it was hot. It wasn't scalding, it didn't burn my finger, nothing like that, it was just kind of hot to the touch. And if you touch only the plastic part, it felt perfectly fine. Basically, yes, it does get hot, but in no way is it in a form that is dangerous or uncomfortable or bad. It's just using it this way produces heat. Now, like I said at the top of this video, this is part of a preview program. This is not necessarily a final look at everything about the system. Obviously, there are some things we have yet to test and try out. We've only done a handful of next generation games that are cross-generational releases. There are other titles that I think are gonna be much more interesting to test out and see how they push the system and how they look and perform. But based on what we've been able to do as far as a lot of the multimedia features, the ability to play backwards compatible games, checking out some of the unique new features like auto HDR and quick resume. There's just a lot of quality of life changes here compared to the Xbox One X that I'm a really big fan of. Yes, there's always the importance of enhancements when it comes to things like having a stronger GPU, CPU, and faster loading times. All that stuff is great, and it's stuff that I think we're mostly looking to expect out of a next generation system. But as far as the general concept of the Series X, where it's this kind of 
evolution of the One X and just taking a look at what worked on that system and tweaking it further by doing things like enhancing the backwards compatibility, giving easier access to things like how to share screenshots and gameplay. I really love the changes here. There are of course more things with the system that I want to test with the final version of it when it releases, and obviously I'm going to compare some of that stuff to the PS5 once we have that system out and we have our hands on that to compare, but as of right now, just the experience of having access to a Series X and testing out these features go, this has just solidified my excitement for next-gen systems.